see why. Ah. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming. If you'd like to come closer, it's uh, please do. And also, uh, we were meant to have 40 minutes of uh, panel debate, but I would strongly encourage you to uh, interact with us and raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, and when you ask a question, I will repeat it so that it can go in the, in the stream. Um, so this panel is organized by Sound and Music, and we have uh, Harry here, uh, which um, would be happy to answer any question at the end of this, uh, of this panel, on one-to-one -one sessions if you, if you want to engage further, or with, with one of us. There's some forms somewhere to fill, uh, if you'd like, over there, yeah, by the sofa. So uh, in, in today's panel, uh, we're going to explore new platforms and new digital platforms and what are the opportunities for the creation, the distribution and uh, monetization of music. Tomorrow there's also uh, a panel organized by Sun and Music at the same time that will focus particularly on audiences and online audiences. So uh, my name is uh, Jean-Baptiste Thiebaud and uh, I'm a founder of the Music Hack Space and also I work for a company called Rolly. We do a, a musical instrument called the Seaboard and today I'm going to chair the panel. Um, I would like to, to present uh, all the panelists today. We have uh, Robin Rimbo, also known as Scanner, uh, Brittany Bean, who is the CEO of Songdrop, Andrew Dubber, who is a writer and blogger and director of Music Tech Fest, mm -hmm. and Mikela Magas, who is uh, the founder of Music Tech Fest and Stromatolite. Uh, so I would like to well, invite you all to present yourself a bit more and uh, share your views in a thought provoking way so to kick off this debate. Um, Shall I begin? I'm sure. sure. At this end, that means you get more time to prepare. Uh, my name is Robin, yes, and I've, uh, <clears throat> very briefly, been making work for about 35 years, 20 years professionally as a, a composer and musician, and I've been embracing digital networks for everything they offer since the early 90s. I was, uh, in very early days, my work was very controversial because I was using a, a device called a radio scanner which picked up on the airwaves. So I was making work in sort of late 80s, early 90s, hence the name Scanner, uh, using people's mobile phone conversations. So it was already socially engaging in a sense. What I was doing was tuning in the airwaves to other people's mobile phone conversations and incorporating them live into the work. Uh, very cheeky, I know. And uh, I had a website set up in about 94. I remember at those, time, those days, most people didn't have email or anything. And since then, I've used social networks as far as possible. I've been sending out a newsletter since about 95, 96, uh, 1995, 96, and sent this out every month without delay, every single month since then. I've never missed it, no matter where I am in the world, no matter what other pressures there are. I've been a good, committed boy to send this thing out and communicate with my audience. I don't want to say too much, because I think the point of this really is to engage in a conversation. So that's me. Brittany? Hi, y'all. I'm Brittany. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Songdrop, which is a streaming music aggregation technology and allows you to make playlists from multiple services on the internet. And we are currently working on a new platform, which is called Swipe DJ, which is an in-store music product. Um, so we're creating a software layer in between retail businesses and the music industry uh, to kind of open up the um, kind of a retail music marketplace. Uh, and my background's in tech, and I worked at uh, quite a lot of startups since I finished uni. Um, and I have also done quite a lot of kind of random music things. I used to be a tour manager. I worked on something called the River Rat Pack Tour and did a whole bunch of other strange things that people in music tend to do. I managed some bands, had a small label, the usual. Andrew? I always struggle to make these things short because uh, the, the what do you do question is complicated for me. My, um, my day job is I'm Professor of Music Industry Innovation at Birmingham City University. Uh, I'm also the Director of Music Tech Fest, uh, as uh, Jean-Baptiste mentioned, um, which I'm sure will come up in conversation. Um, so we'll leave that there. Um, but my background is in radio and uh, run record label and produced albums and, and done various other things. Uh, probably the most salient kind of um, landmark feature of my career recently 
uh, in the last 10 years at any rate, um, was I wrote a book called The 20 Things You Must Know About Music Online. And people seemed to like it and they shared it and uh, got to the point where about 300,000 copies of it were downloaded, available free, um, and, and shared. Of course, you know, five copies might have been downloaded if I charged any money for it. But what's interesting about that is that uh, Derek Sivis from CD Baby thought it was interesting and sent it to all of the people on CD Baby to, to read. And uh, it's been credited as a, a large influence in the establishment of Bandcamp. Uh, which is an um, uh, e-commerce platform for musicians to sell their own works. So it's this idea that I've kind of developed over a period of time about how do you think about the internet, particularly as an artist, a musician, and how do you approach it in a way that kind of understands it as its own thing, as its own medium. And um, yeah, I'll probably leave that there and we'll come back to that conversation. Thanks. I'll do, I'll do a plug for you then, because Ethan Diamond, who founded Bandcamp, then called you when he got the book and said, we're building this, do you want to be an advisor? So he's been an advisor on Bandcamp. So anybody who's interested in, in that sort of new way of um, independent musicians making uh, money for themselves without big gatekeepers taking a huge chunk, then feel free to talk to Andrew. On the Music Tech Fest front, this emerged out of a roadmap, which I was directing. I actually managed to win a project to direct a roadmap for the future of music technology in Europe um, for the academic side. And we managed to open it up to... Uh, music makers, music creators, creative industries, cultural aspects, not just analysis of sound, not just audio signal processing, which was what that field focused on before, and this has really um, impacted on where the field is now. Um, they are, uh, in fact, uh, opening it up a lot more to user interaction. The whole sort of area of research uh, into user interaction is coming uh, into it in a big way. Um, the other thing that uh, I have managed to do is, as a result of the success of this project, we launched a Music Tech Fest, which we will talk about more, but it's, it's now a global event, and we've already run it in New Zealand and in Boston. In Boston, actually created another whole load of impact, um, which we can talk about. And we're taking it, uh, you know, it's, there's, there's London now in partnership with the LSO, and then uh, Berlin and, and Paris, um, New York, etc. Um, and as a result of all of this as well, I've come to consult to the European Commission on the future of research in this area. And we have, I'm very proud to say, managed to push music to the top of the agenda on the creative industries, where, uh, which was previously dominated by um, broadcasting and gaming. So uh, plenty of areas there where we've managed to disrupt. Well, thank you so much for, for these introductions. Um, so to, to start this debate, I would like to first focus on, on creation and what it means for creators of new music to engage with digital platforms. Uh, internet is probably comparable in terms of uh, its impact on music to, to the printing press. Like the changes uh, are, uh, were um, enormous at the printing press. Music became um, something that was on a sheet and was transmitted through paper. Mm -hmm. Now, um, music is transmitted freely, almost. And it impacts completely the way uh, you engage to an audience and you create it. So uh, in particular, from a, from a practitioner point of view, I would love to, to hear your perspective on how you engage personally with, with new media and new, new, plat new digital platforms. I, I find it actually invaluable, to be truthful. I mean, the tools that are now accessible to us. I mean, I come from a time when I used to release cassettes in the 80s, and that was a case of making cassettes and finding someone who would stock your cassette in a store and trying to sort of uh, engage through letters and then faxes. In fact, I found lots of the faxes recently, and that was fantastic in itself. It's like suddenly finding this incredible archive of faxes from other people trying to engage with you. And my days then were spent largely, I remember, on the telephone and sending faxes, thinking I'd love to make work, but I seem to spend all my time administrating, you know. Then again, our lives are still full of uh, <laughs> administration. But as a, as a practitioner, I, I mean, it, it is really invaluable. I mean, it, it, it means that I can... Often a, there used to be a, a very simple process, which was artist makes uh, work in a certain environment, be it your studio or office or wherever it may be, and then you look for a way to share this with the world, which at the time was always a record label. There was no other way to do it, essentially. Even though we had a punk movement that shook everything up, it still followed a very traditional model, in a sense, which is you have an office where people are, and you have this product, and it has to be distributed through this network of shops. The liberation has been quite incredible, actually. I mean, in terms of making work, it means often you can make sketches of things. You can put ideas online, which lead to other things. The connections with other people is quite invaluable. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the feedback loop is now quite phenomenal with an audience, which you could never have before. 
I mean, it's something that's almost indescribable when you're making work and you can, you can put something on and within 30 seconds kind of get feedback from a complete stranger. Not necessarily always good, <laughs> but it's that loop which is really, really exciting. It's not necessarily about, particularly with music, lots of friends of mine who are more, let's say, traditional composers are making works and desperately seeking to have this work performed by an ensemble in an environment. It means now that often you can make a work and then it's... Uh, its final outcome, you never quite an anticipate where it will be. And I find that quite thrilling, actually, in a way that things... I mean, a, a good example is I, I just had a track on SoundCloud, just a, a kind of demo of something. And it sat there for about two years until somebody came to me and said, uh, we are an advertising company in Amsterdam for deodorant, and we would really love if you would like to license this to us. And it turned into a very fruitful relationship in other ways, in terms of other things, not only financially, but actually led to other projects. And I'm somebody who generally, I'm a yes man. I tend to say yes to lots of things because I'm thrilled by the opportunity. I never generally think about, which sounds foolish perhaps, think about money initially. It's always, is this exciting? Are these people I'd like to work with? Is this a, an occasion that could really lead to something, for me, very fulfilling, and then for an audience? And so the, 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 did, without going on and on, because this has to be a conversation, not a Can You West rap. Uh, this, uh, to me, it's been a, a, a very incredibly positive step forward. I mean, and what I find thrilling is there are no real answers. We don't really know. The guys here are stepping forward in each and their own way. But we don't quite know where it's developing to. And to me, that's what's really, really exciting. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very positive view of, of the opportunities in this space. Um, Brittany was mentioned, you were mentioning earlier, uh, the variety of new tools that emerge uh, based on online platforms. You mentioned supplies and... Yeah, I think... Uh, um, I think it's, it's been interesting to watch the, the transition from how people to kind of build businesses online have moved from a consumption model in music, which was kind of everyone who was kind of creating, um, I'm talking about more kind of social stuff. I'm not talking about things like Ableton and Logic and stuff like that, but kind of these sort of more sort of social business platforms online were all very consumption based. And it was very much about the consumer because the people building these businesses were the consumers. And so for them, they're, they're scratching their own itch, right? You, you, when you start a business, you tend to do it because like, you found a problem and you want to fix it. And as that's kind of grown up and you've seen a lot of, of consumption is a bit kind of, it's a very crowded space, you know? I mean, there's, I think in the UK alone, this is actually the healthiest streaming market in the world. Uh, you have more choice of what pay for streaming like service you can have on your mobile than anywhere else in the world. Something like 32, I think individual services you can sign up for. Um, and y I wouldn't recommend getting into that business if you're thinking about it. <laughs> it's difficult. Um, and we've seen a lot of, of a, a transition into people building more accessible tools for artists and more accessible tools for people to collaborate. Um, I think it was quite, it must have been, because I can't remember when their album came out, their first album, it was a few years ago. But um, there's a band called Lanterns on the Lake they're signed to Bella Union. And I remember um, Simon Raymond was talking about how he really liked that when he was chatting to them, they recorded over Skype. So like they were, t they had a problem. They were living in different places and they were all trying to record. So they used to actually record via Skype. Um, and you know, people are now building tools to solve that problem. So there's a company called Splice, um, which is based out of New York, I believe. Um, it's in, I think it's still in private beta, but it's essentially, um, it's a tool for people to record together, and it's also like um, kind of version control for tracks. So rather than having like, you know, 800 different versions of like unmastered track seven version 432, um, it actually just maintains kind of a, a list of what that is. It's, um, I think they call it GitHub for music, but if you're not quite technical, you've probably never had to deal with GitHub, um, uh, which is version control for software. Um, but it's, you know, companies like that are getting a lot of attention. I'm quite sure that was invested in by um, a, a relatively big name. Um, I think Mark Andreessen put the cash behind that. Um, and it's nice to see that thing happening. It's nice to see new technologies coming out for creators rather than just consu like consumers of music. Um, there's another company that's come out recently called Mix Genius, um, which is based out of Montreal. And that's kind of a, an automated uh, mixing service. So there's quite a bit of, um, I think, 
controversy around that. There's a lot of people that say, you know, you're trying to replace sound engineers. You're trying to get rid of, of people who, you know, do the mixing and, and people who actually do mastering. And I think it's, that's almost looking at it in the wrong way. Um, they've also put a, another product out that does, that does mastering as well. Um, but that's kind of, when you look at how easy it is now for people to, to actually record something, um, you know, you can download pretty much anything for free and start making noise on your laptop. Um, these tools are there to kind of help these people get started. And it's a, an inexpensive way to start to professionalize the, the tracks you're making in your bedroom, like all these bedroom DJs and stuff. And I don't think that's ever gonna replace anything, but I think it's good to see a, a movement of, of technology that is accessible to your average person and isn't gonna cost them you know, 300 quid on the app store, um, but is you know, $10 a month or something to, to master some tracks and have them mixed. And I think it's, it's nice to see that change. And it's good that there are companies coming out and doing that now. And it's, it's not just you know, another, another YouTube um, making an appearance. Thanks, Brittany. I think it's, it's very interesting that new companies today start solving problems at the global level that well, are aimed at making composers and producers' life uh, easier or faster. Um, Andrew, perhaps you, you could uh, well, uh, explain from your perspective, what do you think are the needs uh, from, from composers and producers and, and broadcasters that uh, could be solved by technology in the, in the, in the future, uh, as far as creation is concerned? Well, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of in the position where I don't think the interesting thing has happened yet. Um, and that we, I, mean, I, I talk about ages of media, and you were, right, you, you know, we had the print age where the main way in which music was produced, consumed, and, and, uh, and distributed was dots on paper. You'd go to a shop, you'd pick up something, you'd take it home, you'd play it badly on the piano. And then, we sh I mean, we've, we've gone through five ages. Uh, there was the oral age, the scribal age, the print age, the electric age, which was the age of recordings and broadcasting. And now, theoretically, we're in the digital age, but what we're doing in the digital age is to focus on recordings and broadcasting, which are electric age technologies. So the, the, the thing that people do in order to create music, uh, the tools of that have been distributed more widely, but we, we're not actually operating, I don't think, natively within the digital space yet. So the, the, the thing that people all do to create music hasn't substantively changed, at least the goal of it hasn't. And I think what we're going to start to notice is that the things that people think are, are sort of ancillary to that process of creation of music, which are these things about uh, sharing and uh, doing things sort of remotely or working on projects together, or, or actually using the technologies of interaction as a process of creation of music, mm -hmm. as a way of collaborating, whether it's with objects in three-dimensional space or whether it's uh, virtually online. It's that that's the interesting bit, not the fact that you get a recording at the end of it that you can sell. Um, and I think that all of the people trying to solve the problems of how do we distribute and, and sell recordings are solving an electric age problem using digital age tools rather than thinking about the digital age on its own terms. And I think that's a really interesting approach to take is what are the natively digital ways of making music? What, I mean, if, if your goal as a musician is to create a commodity that you can then go out and sell, then that's a recording, or it's sheet music, or it's something like that. And there may be a digital equivalent of that that we, we haven't kind of discovered yet, but I, I doubt that it's dots on, on a screen or MP3s, it's recordings of music. I think this feels very transitional. I think what we haven't found yet is the natively digital commodity, but, but similarly, the way in which people form a band or become a composer or make an orchestra or those sorts of things, I think we're still very much kind of, I mean, these things don't ever get replaced. You can still buy sheet music in a store. Um, the, the mere fact that we have recordings and broadcasting now doesn't make that go away, but it's a shifting of ratios, and it's a really powerful shifting of ratios. That's not, by any stretch, the main way in which people produce, consume, or distribute music. Um, and so looking at where the kind of the shifts are in that respect, if you sort of take a, a step back and go, where is music, what is music now? Um, and what is music supposed to do? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, if it is, I have something that I need to express and then I'd like to sell it to you, then, then obviously there's a way of doing that. But actually, music is a way in which human beings make meaning for other human beings. And if you sort of take that really broad brushstrokes approach, it's like, okay, with these tools that we have, what opportunities do we have using this kind of musical language to make meaning for other people? Is it about 
uh, a, a professional producer and a, and a passive consumer, or is it something that's more kind of participatory, or is it something that, you know, and I don't think there's a recipe for this, but I think that asking these sorts of questions leads you to some interesting answers, um, and that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in for, for music creation, which is what your question was, is I, I think there's an opportunity here to invent new types of music creation, distribution, promotion, and so on, um, that we haven't really thought of yet, or, or at least we haven't noticed the people who have thought of them. So. Thank you so much. I mean, I would like, uh, b before I ask Michaela for, for further uh, thoughts, I would just like to stay a little bit on, on these thoughts and ask uh, Scanner what, what he thinks about, about this. Uh, before we were making cassettes, we were making vinyls. If we don't know what this future thing is, if, future format of music, uh, what, what does it inspire? It's interesting. I think some very valuable points Andrew brought up. I mean, actually, for me, I realise one of the most restrictive aspects of kind of new technologies is actually bandwidth in terms of actually, I live in East London, and I'm still on the same speed of the internet for the last 15 years, and my local exchange in Shoreditch has no desire, apparently. It's very I, much a London problem. It's funny, and I, I've received a, quite an extraordinary email from a British Telecom last week, and it's quite a funny moment. When they sent an email out, and it said, Dear Mr. Rambo, uh, we're pleased to let you know that your local exchange, XXXXX, they hadn't filled in the name, so it was just a, a form letter, is pleased to say you're now going to have fast internet, so log on to this site. So I logged on, and it's a blank page. So then about an hour <laughs> later, I receive another email with the same details with XXXXX. I log on to the page, but this time you can see that it says you, if you want to register interest. So then it takes you to the next page, I registered interest. And it said, sorry, we have, uh, there, was no, there are no plans to roll out fast internet in your area in London. Then the next day I receive a letter from British Telecom, or an email, to say, sorry, we made a mistake yesterday, please ignore any communications from us. <laughs> and it's funny because, you know, if, if I need, and I, I collaborate a lot, because music, what I love about it, it's, it's a very social interaction. I mean, it's one thing beyond, let's say, reading a book. It's me reading the book. Music is something we're very much socially engaged in. It's something that we share. And when we go to concerts, I was in Hyde Park yesterday, hence I look a bit like a tomato. And I was watching lots of bands, but I was there with about 50,000 other people. Sometimes it's not the most charming place to be. But sharing that one moment with a musician on stage with a group of people is a phenomenal aspect. And music has that ability. But actually, the most restrictive thing is this kind of bandwidth issue, which is just phenomenal. If I need to collaborate, as I do with a piano player, and I send a piece of music, and I send something that's five minutes long, it can take up to 35 minutes, 40 minutes, just to upload this file, which means any process is being choked at the initiation. So it's one thing I find really frustrating. Then I, I work in some places, and suddenly it just flies through, and you think, why don't I live there? Yeah, I and can I solve that problem for you really quickly. Move to Birmingham. <laughs> I, honestly, I had uh, the, the Virgin Media guy came around yesterday to fix my internet because it dropped down from its ordinary 100 megabyte uh, download uh. speed, 12 up, um, because, and, and that was worrying. So they just completely replaced the box. But the, the fact is the norm is basically you, you get the thing that you're trying to download or upload before you even thought of pressing the button. Mm. It's, uh, yeah. it's, what I'm trying to say is actually ultimately... But the, the cable in London is, a, is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting because you notice that companies are developing these technologies for us to use. And let's say Apple is a good example. And lots of companies speak about the cloud and speak about these, these things... It, it simply doesn't work, I mean, at the moment. It can't work for a long time. I mean, I've lived there for 15 years, and they said they have no intention in East London of extending that network. And I spoke to a private company, and they have no intention either of coming in to do it. And if you want to do it, it's going to cost £60,000, which is a lot of money. Well, that's because of who owns the land more than anything yeah. else. But I'm just, what I'm trying to say is, you know, it's, we have these developments which are phenomenally exciting, but there's a, there's a large amount of people who just cannot access them, unfortunately. It's a real yeah. pity. It's a, it's a mundane point, but it's, it's like the water supply being cut off at the mains. Yeah, definitely. I can relate to that. Um, <laughs> Do you want me to comment on that? Uh, no, actually, uh, Michele, if you don't mind, uh, would you bring a bit of blue sky thinking about... Um, well, I can give you blue sky thinking on this topic immediately because we have recommended that upload speeds should be the same as download speeds in most operators in Europe to yeah. begin with. Mm -hmm. Because what we are uh, looking at is a, is a generation of content creators. We call it Generation C, which is a Google term, actually. Um, I mean, it, it's ov obviously Google's interest to have very good figures about content creators. Um, yeah. It is, after all, what is churning out all this wonderful content on YouTube and everything else. But, uh, you know, we passed Generation X and Y, uh, and that was about all about sort of web delivery and the top-down approach. 
and really in, in at this moment what we need to be looking at in terms of and you know I have to speak for the, in terms of the commission it's infrastructure in terms of infrastructure to allow content creation you do need to have upload speeds that are on par with download speeds now obviously it's not going to solve the problem in East London right now and of course this is something that, <laughs> that is going to really have to be kind of um, put put forward on, on on local agendas but that's another matter um, but uh, the blue sky thinking, uh, maybe well, I'm, I was, I'm, I was I'm thinking, I'm in sort fact, of uh, because you in a unique position advocating mm. the needs of uh, both industry and academia mm -hmm. and lobbying that uh, to, to Brussels, uh, mm -hmm. you've been exposed to a lot of projects, yeah. academic projects yeah. that are specifically related to music, music creation, mm -hmm. music distribution. Uh, so what do you think... Um, what are European institutions looking into in terms of creation, and how does how could that relate to, um, well, digital platforms? And uh, what what do you think the future is going to be made? Well, the future is always now. I mean, you know, we, we, in the 60s, people were predicting sliding doors and 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 overalls, and now you go to local Tesco's and you have shell suits and sliding doors. It's not hardly glamorous, you know. You, you don't you don't predict the future from from um, uh, sort of saying, um, um, I think what's going to happen in five years' time, it will be this, it will be more, let's invent it. Uh, I think we sort of, some of us agree on it. And so that's what we're doing. What we're saying is, um, uh, first of all, what is music about? Music is about expression, it's about playing, about performance. A lot of the European research has shifted towards that. Uh, so it's not just about analysis, it's not just about post-processing. And we're talking about, um, you know, the electronic age, which actually managed to package music into products and smooth over the cracks, do auto-tune, and launch it out into formats that were products that you bought. But what we are now bringing back, and both you and I come from the maker community, and we're very much, I mean, actually, um, uh, uh, JB, Jean-Baptiste over there, he's known JB by the maker community, by the way. Um, um, both of us have been really active in um, stimulating this creative community of makers who make new types of sounds, new types of interest, uh, instruments, who um, reuse, reappropriate existing instruments, who look at different ways of creating music. And this field is phenomenal, and we are having, we are experiencing a, just a, basically a, a, a massive movement now. And wherever we go in the world now, wherever we run events. Um, and where we, where we ran the Music Tech Fest, we went to New Zealand. We didn't realize what a big community was in, already in New Zealand in terms of making their own um, uh, instruments, uh, circuit bending, doing all this sort of uh, wonderful experimentation, using old types of electronics. And uh, the wonderful thing about this is massively liberating because all the bits that you need in order to express yourself in this way are so cheap. You have like sensors are ultra cheap. You know the most expensive bit that you need maybe is a transducer. I mean any kid on the street um, can, uh, with a bit of creativity and a bit of know-how, create their own little instrument. Now, if you think about sort of the revolution back in the 80s of sort of the street culture and what those kids could access were turntables, so they started messing around with turntables. If, someone, if, they, if they could have afforded a saxophone at that time, perhaps you'd have had different music that came out of that. Um, uh, but the, in those days, uh, buying an instrument, you had to have parents who could afford it, you know, a serious instrument. Or you had to have access to a community hall where you could practice. I mean, it wasn't an easy thing. Now you can create an instrument that is, um, you know, there's a range. You can do something super simple and that's super effective and already start creating with it. Now, what that's bringing back to people, and I think this is why our community is growing so fast, is the immediacy of expression. So it's all about um, messing around with a few bits that you've got, putting something together quickly and seeing how you can communicate through music by using these things. And it's really immediate. So the passion and the feeling behind music and <clears throat> your way of expressing yourself through music comes through really, really strongly. And it can be rough around the edges. It's a bit like, you know, you may mention the punk movement. Um, I mean, that's what was 
at the core of it. It was that raw expression. It was in your face, but it was there. It was nobody was messing with. It. Nobody was smoothing over it afterwards. And this is this is what we, you know. I call it gunk, geek punk now, because basically that's what people are doing. And 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 you see them jump on stage. We say to them, you know, it's an experimental stage, uh, experimental space. Jump on stage, unrehearsed. Pull other people with you. Perform with them. And um, People do this, and what's wonderful about it is they don't fall over at all. In fact, it's brilliant because it's immediate, because it's 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 um, uh, genuinely felt, and it's 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 um, just uh, one of those sort of. It's become a wonderful vehicle for expression. So this is really where the strength is. Uh, uh, you are on in Rolly. Rolly have invented a new uh, uh, interface, uh, a new keyboard, a new type of keyboard. Um, that one is already uh, allowing some artists to find new ways of expressing themselves. So um, we invited Jamie Cullum last year to try uh, the, the Rolly keyboard and um, it showed that it wasn't just the kids who are messing around with these um, uh, sensors and, and circuit bending, but also uh, established artists who have got a repertoire who then get presented with a new instrument and they're able to create completely new types of sounds on them and they get very excited about this because they suddenly get to experiment in a very new way. And to them, it's opening up new areas of creativity for them. So it applies to existing musicians as well. Andrew, you would like to I just on coming on that, that, you used the word experimental a few times and I, I think that's really interesting. We, we were at uh, Steim in Amsterdam uh, last week talking about getting involved and in bringing Music Tech Fest to the Netherlands, and one of the things that, that came out of that conversation was this idea that experimental music hasn't happened for about 40 years now. It's just sort of become a genre rather than genuine experimentation, or this was kind of like the, it was a grand sweeping generalization, obviously, but, but this idea of um, uh, experimental music having become a way of um, uh, performing the same thing over and over again, essentially, sort of working with the same sorts of ideas in the same sorts of ways to come up with uh, new types of music. And I, I was thinking about, when you go back 40 years and you think about what sorts of experimentation were taking place, and you think about the, um, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the, the minimalism that was going on at the time that was using reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape recordings because that was an interesting thing to use, or you go back further, and it, it was people experimenting with the available technologies in order to say, how can we make music out of these things? And I haven't seen a lot of that. I mean, you were talking about um, using scanners, for instance, and, and that was kind of like experimenting with that technology. And again, it's about using the available prevailing technologies to, to do a thing. I don't know of anybody, I mean, and I, I, I'm not claiming to know all kind of contemporary music, I don't know anybody who is doing the equivalent of that, but in a digital context, rather There's than using... Of stuff, actually, I have to say. I mean, what's interesting is, there's been a movement in the last 10 years, a kind of modular synthesis movement, which yeah. is really exciting, which is where... And what, what I find really exciting, actually, is meeting people who have no musical experience at all, have no uh, desire to learn notes, to read scores or anything. And I think this is what, what I find amusing and thrilling at the same time, which I, I met a guy recently, I went to this kind of conference, and he was performing, and it was lots of the most difficult abstract noises you could ever imagine. He said, I'm just not interested in music, he said. I just love to make noises. And it was really pleasing to find somebody, it wasn't very pleasing to your ear, mm -hmm. but for him there was such a joy, it was so, so, it made me really happy to see the joy in this man's, you know, body in a way, in his, his whole being, that he could just make all these funny noises. And actually, I mean, it's something I followed very closely all my career, which is developments in new technologies and how they enable me to do things. And I'm always looking for new tools. Tool. The, the Roly, maybe we had met before, because the Roly... Uh, when it first began, I was communicating with one of the guys there because I thought this was really thrilling. And, you know, ev whether it's... I mean, I've been working at MIT for the last five months this year as a visiting mm -hmm. artist, and I, I'm working there with a team developing uh, all kinds of things about body experiences to sound, how when you listen to sound, it's not just about here, it's mm -hmm. about a whole mm -hmm. body thing. So I've been working with a team developing something for next year, which is about how we experience sound through the body. There is stuff going on, there really is. Maybe, you know, it's just... No, I mean, yeah. in, in terms of... But there are people using the technology. The, uh, the point that I'm not making very, very clear is the context. So there are people who are using the tools and technologies, but in the same way that they use the older tools and technologies in order to kind of put on a performance or to make a recording or to... to the, the end product doesn't seem to be different. It's as an experience or as a... Um, uh, and, and maybe I'm, I'm kind of... 
uh, missing something, but a lot of the, um, I mean, other than the embodied stuff, obviously, but a lot of the outcomes of people who are using new technologies and new works are to present new works in old ways, if you see what I mean. Is that, does it, is that fair? I feel like I really agree with what you're saying. It seems like, basically, there are people doing it, uh, sort of using new technology actually in new contexts, but we basically just don't hear about it. Right. So actually, that makes a lot of sense. Doing it, but they're not the people who um, sort, of, you know, sort of music critics are talking about. You don't read about them in magazines. Mm. Um, <coughs> so yeah, it's like new artists are using new technology, but they seem to just, it, it, it ends up being presented on the stage or released through CDs for labels. That's a really encouraging idea. The, the idea that, that these things are going on when are just not in those contexts to experience them. Yeah, I, I like, um, I hope that's true. Well, I think this is where all our community is coming out of, or from, well, from, from, from those circles. Definitely, and, and community is, is acute to the next, uh, to the next subject. Thank you so much for that. Uh, which is about the distribution uh, of music, reaching out to an audience. What, what does it mean for artists? Now, what are their, the opportunities, but also the risks associated to digital media digital platforms for artists. Um, reaching an audience is the next stage after creation. The final stage is monetization, and we'll talk about this uh, later. But first, uh, maybe from your experience, uh, Robin, how did digital platforms change your approach to, to reaching out an audience? I mean, the step from exchanging cassettes and this org the organicity of that uh, music exchange to availability in Singapore mm. or in the US as soon as it's uploaded on SoundCloud? I mean, for me, th there's still a thrill to find that in a traditional model, you would have to very much negotiate or navigate and negotiate shops and these kind of very traditional retail outlets. Today, I, I, I like the fact that I get statements, digital statements, you get a PDF that says your music was used in this place, was heard over here, I mean, I use this company called The Orchard, who are just basically, mm. you know, following a fairly traditional model, and these guys would know The Orchard. Just they essentially take your work and they distribute it, so it ends up on Spotify, it ends up on all kinds of places. It's very easy to argue in a negative way that some of these places don't pay you very much back. To be truthful, that, you know, no, they, you don't earn very high returns on some uh, digital streaming. But, you know, for me, it's about the access to this stuff. I mean, the, the first things I ever released, and still when I release things, in whatever way they are, whether it's digitally, whether it's still on a CD or a vinyl record, to me is about making this stuff accessible. I've never been somebody who went out to make a living by selling product, and still that's not something that interests me. It's they're almost like a, a byproduct of what I do. And I don't mean that to sound arrogant in any way. It's not like I... You know, I, I live at home thinking, I wish I could, you know, what I don't want to do is sit there and think, wow, I wish I could sell another, you know, 500 records or wish I could clear all these boxes of CDs out or I wish somebody would buy all these tracks online. You know, for me, it's about the more experiential thing and the, the, a kind of digital development has enabled this process to happen so much more. As I mentioned earlier, the feedback process is very exciting, but the fact that things do, you get feedback from somebody in Vietnam who discovers what you've done. I mean, it sounds terribly pompous to put it like this, but in the past, you'd every now and, now and again receive a letter from someone saying, dear Mr. Scanner, you know, I really like your work, thank you, something like this, but actually usually went on and on. Every, almost every week I do receive a letter from somebody saying something extremely encouraging. And that's not to sit here and sound really arrogant and pompous, but to say it has meaning to complete strangers that are far, far away from your experience. And I can directly communicate with these people. And I always write back, I'm a good boy, and I always communicate with all the people that ever write to me. I don't ignore them. There was a time when people thought MySpace, this digital network online, I'm not sure. I mean, what I'm cautious of in these, in these scenarios is also using terms where people don't really understand. What, when you say circuit bending, I suddenly realize there's probably lots of people who doesn't know what circuit bending is, for example. Do you, does everybody know what circuit bending actually is? No, so that's what I wonder. I think it would just have to be cautious on it. It's very easy to kind of fall, 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 to sl fall to slip over a little bit. And uh, I don't mean that rudely, I just mean it's very easy when one is engaged in these technologies to assume that everybody knows what we're talking about. Uh, but uh, to me, the, the, and I keep using this term, there is a thrill still of that, of, of, of allowing this stuff to come, to come back at you all the time and sending it out there. And it's like sending letters out and never knowing what's coming back. And for years, I've made projects that have depended largely upon public coming to me. I mean, I've got a thing at the moment, which I can just mention because we, we corresponded about it, which is I've got a piece coming onto the Museum of London, Docklands, called Bridging the World, where it's a, an online invitation to people to deliver content for this installation that happens in the museum. 
literally just listing names of bridges around the world. And I've had hundreds of responses, and each day when I, I collect my email, I suddenly have an email of somebody saying, here's a list of bridges I read for you in Italy. Here's some in Greece. Here's some in Singapore. Here's some in Vietnam. And it's phenomenal each day to receive this back. And so the work becomes beyond me. It becomes about a more social engagement. Mm. So I'm not sure. It's very difficult to answer very simple questions sometimes, I think, as we all find here. You know, it's very difficult to answer in a very straightforward way. There are no yes and no answers, mm. you know. And it's, things are always in a state of flux. And to me, again, that's exciting, that, that state of flux. It would be interesting, uh, I suppose, to, to, to present a different perspective from, uh, from Brittany, who, who has a company that allow listeners to share with, with other listeners. What, I, mean, I, what think, are the... I think it's interesting. You talk about kind of the navigating kind of a traditional distribution model. And I think it, that kind of became a thing that people understood, right? You knew you had to get on the phone and ring some people up and send some faxes or many faxes. And that was a kind of set system. There was a way that it worked and everyone knew how that worked. And I think the issue we have now is that the, distrib like the entire distribution model has changed. There are no rules. There's not a set way to do things. There's not a, well, if I just do this and I get it in these shops and I'll start selling. Instead, it's we don't know where it should go because we're still, as you mentioned earlier, in a state of a bit of flux. Um, you know, we're still kind of getting to grips with these technologies and getting to grips with new distribution platforms, many of which aren't even monetized. Um, and many of which the, the creator is the one who's paying to put something on. The artist is the one who's paying to have it available. Um, and they're not getting paid for playback. So you kind of have to look at... Um, I think how we begin to make sense of the new distribution models and how we start to figure that out, it's something that hasn't happened yet. Um, the access model, while you know, for us maybe, and probably the people in here, is seen as kind of a done deal. But the reality is there's only like you know, 20 million Spotify subscribers, the majority of which are on a free tier that's ad supported. Um, that's nothing, that's not very many people there's like a billion people on Facebook. Um, and you know we're still getting to a point where digital distribution starts to become and access, the model of access, begins to become something that everyone starts to understand. It's why major labels have telco tie-ups. You know, it's why they, they want to put these, they want to pre-install Spotify or Deezer or whatever, Deezer's probably a bad example because they've got terrible pickup, but um, you know, to, to put these things on mobile devices because they want to get that distribution directly to you. Um, and I think how we begin to navigate distribution digitally is only, only just happening now, where people are starting to think about strategies around it and artists who are trying to commercialize their work, not necessarily people who are just kind of doing something for the love of doing it, but people who are trying to make a commercial enterprise of selling music are trying to figure out how to do this in a way that makes sense. Um, from a, a platform perspective, um, from the, the other side of the table, um, it's very difficult for, for people like me who, who have digital platforms to figure out how to make a business out of it. Um, it's very difficult to figure out how, how do you take a slice of that pie um, in order to provide a service to someone. So it's why one of the reasons why we're looking into a, a less of a consumer-led market and more of a, a B2B market and something around enterprise, um, which allows us to start to look at places that traditionally aren't spending, you know, who are happy to spend money on music, but aren't spending it in the way that, that we kind of expect consumers to. Um, and when we started out working on building kind of like, I mean, for us, we, we ended up with a company that was built out of a toy. Um, when we started Song Drop, we did it because I sent an email to one of my co-founders saying, I can't remember any of the music that I had open in a browser window. It was like 15 SoundCloud tabs. Can we build something to fix this? And you, know, you kind of build these little toys around, around this stuff and then try and build a company out of it. But I think how fans especially begin to, and general consumers, not necessarily your, your kind of diehard music fan, uh, start to engage with, with artists is where it's getting interesting. And I think your comment, Robin, about feedback and being able to have that immediately, like that is really cool. You can just put something up and suddenly you get like immediate feedback. Oh, cool, great. So you like it, I'll make more. But also you can, well, you can statistically, you can see where you are with something, which is quite yeah. different today. In the past, you'd have to wait sometimes up to a year to know, did I sell any CDs or yeah. not? Are they still <laughs> sitting in a box? Whereas today you wait, can waiting see for a royalty 20 statement. people, then 200, then 2,000. Or did 2, my distributor go yeah. bankrupt and yeah, exactly. did I lose all my stock? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. 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 
I, I think this is, I mean, Brittany brings up a really good point, um, but it's about why it's important to understand this space, not in terms of understand what all the ingredients are and, and who the players are and where the best margins are and so you can put together the recipe that's correct for you, but to understand what's possible in the space so you can make something that's of use to you by connecting what... Uh, how many people here are actually musicians, composers? Uh, okay, broad cross section. Okay, quite a few. Um, well, okay, so you have music that you create and there are people who, who listen to it. In a, you know... It's more complicated than that, but those are the kind of the main ingredients that you want to put together. Um, so what you do is you say, well, how do these people operate? How does my music make meaning for people? In what ways can I connect the dots that already exist, that is the most meaningful, most useful, and most kind of productive? And I used to talk about this as, we were talking about eight years ago when I was writing this kind of book about music online. I used to talk about these things as Lego blocks. There's a whole kind of pile of Lego blocks, all the things that are available, all the bits of the internet that you can piece together to build the thing that you want. But it's actually more interesting than that because it's also clay. You can actually make your own shapes and make your own things. And you don't need to understand how to do the pottery, to kind of exaggerate the metaphor a little bit. But, um, but actually, you need to know what sorts of meaningful communication you want to have with your audience, what sort of meaning you want to make for them, how you would like that relationship to go, and how you, would, you, know, how, how you want to establish that. And you can work with technologists really, really easily to say, I imagine a world in which my music can do these things with these people in this way. Uh, and they go, well, I know how to do that. If I connect this with that, and I build something that does this, I can code, and I can create, and I can solder and I can wire, here is your thing. This makes this possible. So the, the actual, it's raw material that's available on the internet, not a series of products that you can choose to use or not use. And I think that's, that's a much more interesting way to think about it. But you need to understand what the possibilities of that space are so you can picture yourself and your music within that. Michaela, would, would you like first to <clears throat> explain what um, Circuit Bending is, just to resolve uh, <laughs> sure, one thing? Sure, can do, and, no and, and problem. And second, maybe elaborate a little bit more on what Andrew has been, has been uh, hinting so, at this exchange and the possibilities that you create through uh, Music Tech Fest of artists meeting engineers to create uh, better tools for the creation, but also <laughs> to engage, uh, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. So circuit bending. Um, it's very simple, really. I mean, you can use a circuit that's uh, been built to perform a particular electronic function, and then you can reappropriate it um, by soldering other sort of roots through the circuit. So it, it sort of um, um, it can be reappropriated. So it's basically like recycling old electronics. And um, um, a lots of our community do that. They will take old Casio players and they will make new types of instruments out of them. But it can also happen in much more rudimentary ways. And this is not uh, sort of strictly speaking circuit bending in a traditional sense. <coughs> but um, uh, so one of our hackers uh, at the in, in New Zealand actually took a didgeridoo and blocked it on one side with one of those mini speakers and then uh, fed the electronic music from the iPad through the didgeridoo from that side. So because the didgeridoo was blocked on one side, was being fed um, this sound, um, it, it was amplified um, through the tube and it created a particular resonance. And then he beatboxed with, with the outlet. So, so it was blocked on here. It's very hard to describe. It's better to see it, actually. And the sound's coming out from here. It's being amplified by the didgeridoo and he's beatboxing with it and it's all going out through the mic. So created a completely different way of using a traditional instrument um, by fitting it with some electronics and uh, playing with it. So this is, this is, there, are, there are lots of creative ways in which you can reappropriate existing instruments or existing electronics um, or build entirely new ones. Um, and, you know, I'm going to go back to the fact that uh, music is, uh, the most important thing about music is it's a, a way of uh, expressing, expressing oneself creatively. Um, and that is, it probably has affordances that other creative, um, uh, other types of creativity do not afford. So you know, do not allow. Um, so and, and and in this sense, it is massively attractive to a huge amount of people, not just musicians. It's it's attractive to a huge bunch of amateurs of people who call themselves like. You know, you mentioned the guy really loved making noise. I mean, because it actually brings something else out of him. It's something that he can't express with words if it's writing or any other way. Um, and this is massively important. If you actually look at which platforms are really on the rise, we're talking SoundCloud, we're talking Bandcamp, both of them are actually devoted to um, 
creative expression and enable and are enabling platforms for people to express themselves musically or through sound. I mean, you know, you know it can be noise if you want. Um, and I think, you know, they are, th that's actually a sign of the times. I think that the question about distribution is actually, uh, distribution as an idea is about music is a product and it ne therefore needs to be distributed. Um, I think I like to take it back to, to its roots, to performance, to expression. And I think with the cloud working and the upload speeds working and download speeds working properly, I think we are now much closer to communicating through music in much more immediate ways. And this is where it's at for me. So this is where it's at, I think, for a lot of our, our community. And I think this is incredibly exciting. Um, so, you know, also, you know, music performance concerts are um, really on the app. So the digital space, the digital platforms and um, digital means to create music and live performance are really the two areas that are, are, are growing. Um, I think for all the right reasons. Can I just come in on that very briefly? I, I was reading about circuit bending quite recently because uh, I'm, I'm writing uh, a book chapter about um, the, sort of the development of, of those ideas. And the story that I heard, and I don't know how true this is, but it's a good story, is that the uh, where circuit bending comes from is actually there was a broken speak and, do you, you know, speak and spell. It was an old toy mm. that had some electronic circuitry in it. And literally, because it was broken, somebody took it and bent the circuit board inside it and found it made different noises when you did that. And that was kind of the origin of this idea of if we take things to bits, if we own our electronics and we can make new things from them, just by kind of using them in a way that we're not supposed to, we can make new types of new noises, new types of experience. And I really like that, that kind of origin myth of, uh, of, of circuit bending. But the other thing I was going to say on the, um, uh, on the making noises and SoundCloud connection, I have a SoundCloud account and occasionally I do spoken word things and occasionally I sort of find things interesting and record people and so on. The single most listened to SoundCloud track I have was a bathroom tap in a hotel room in Venezuela, um, which happened to vibrate in a way that was really pleasing. And it, it just made this kind of noise. You turn it on a little bit and it would just go... And it, it did it for a long period of time, and it was, it was this really, and it had overtones. It was like kind of tube and throat singing. It was, it was just beautiful. But it was, uh, and I, we actually video recorded to prove that that's what it was. But it was just the sound that this kind of shonky hotel room in Caracas happened to make. And I just thought that was that was really interesting. That that's the thing that people liked. Yeah, but of some what of I the made. classics <laughs> of music yeah. were done with. I mean, you know, you. I mean, I'm sure everybody here has watched all the documentaries about albums, famous albums, and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. the amount of stuff like that that has mm. Been appropriated and it's been used by artists, and it became the sort of the feature, the sort of the, the sort of the really attractive part of, of a track. I mean, you know, it's uh, I mean even Motown uh, in innovation within Motown recordings, you know, famously was like bicycle chains and stuff like that to get kind of create rhythms and things like that. I mean, it's it, we're, we're back at with we're, we're doing this, and of course, what we can now do is loop them, and we can easily kind of. Um, incorporate them so you, you don't have to kind of try and keep the rhythm in. you can just record it once you can put it into the mix and it's just you've got all the tools at your disposal yeah. as as other people have said previously if you know your tools or you know which tools you can use with it just make a track I love the idea that the most influential stuff and, and particularly in popular music history has been where people have been kicking at the edges of the technology and seeing what's possible. There's sort of the, the classic Sgt. Pepper's mm -hmm. OK Computer, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. What else can we, what sort of noises haven't we heard? What sort of things can this technology do that we haven't seen yet? Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting place to start. Yeah, and I think that uh, just because I'm also conscious of time and maybe that you have questions, I, w I would like to, um, to talk a little bit about uh, the hard problem, <laughs> which is uh, how can composers in this new ecosystem uh, and makers of new music can make a living. And what are the opportunities that are opened? Um, and uh, Robin, in particular, I mean, I, I think that your practice has changed and adapted a little bit to, mm. to this new economy. What, what, from your perspective, works and, and will work in the future uh, to, to make and monetize mm. your, your art and, and productions? Gam gambling. So I gamble <laughs> a lot on the horses. <laughs> it's proved very much more, pr no, I'm joking. Don't do that. I really am. Although a friend just won £53,000 on the World Cup. He put one pound and he won £53,000. Not to encourage, I've never gambled, but uh, that was an astounding story. And he's a musician who's never made a penny, so I felt really happy for him. <laughs> Bastard. Uh, so, uh, 
<laughs> it, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I did mention just now, and I'd still, it's something that actually selling product has never been a kind of uh, uh, an ambition of mine. I mean, when I first started making a living professionally as a composer, it was 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, around this time in the summer when I gave up my job. I finished university, I studied literature, had a job in a music library working in Fulham. And I started to have little bits of work. I released a CD and suddenly thought, if I can, my rent was £250 a month. If I can have enough work that pays that a month, then I can give up my job. And I thought, I can always get another job. And then you suddenly earn £300 and you think, I'm £50 over my budget. That's extraordinary. You know, I can actually live even, you know, even better now. That's how wild I can get. And also eat. <laughs> and eat, yeah. I forgot about those things. Yeah, I've got to keep my figure. I eat tissues like a supermodel. And uh, it's, it's interesting because, you know, as the years have passed, there's been different ways that money has come through in a sense. I mean, I, I find that the solution is never to do one thing. I mean, any friends who are, follow a traditional model of person writing a piece of music won't really earn anything because you sit there desperately hoping that someone will perform this music which you're not really going to get paid very much for you're desperately hoping you're going to get a commission and sadly which often doesn't come through so it, multitasking a term we overuse is, is, is the most valuable thing and what I tend to do is work on an absurd number of projects at the same time mm. which means that some will pay nothing and some will pay quite well but it takes years and years of, of investment of your own time. What I'm struck by, and it's quite interesting when I give a talk at a music university, is you, know, you have to work hard. I mean, I, th I find it extraordinary sometimes that people sometimes just think, oh, I'm just going to write some music and I'll be really successful. And that happens for lots of people. And lots of people are painters and that happens to them. And there's a far bigger number who don't make any money and get really dispirited about it. But you have to work, you know. And I, I don't want to sound like, you know, a dad or something. I don't have kids. This is my one chance to say it. Uh, <laughs> but it is, you know, you, you wake up, I wake up early and I work all day. Yeah. And, I, and I never miss a deadline. I've never missed a deadline in 20 years of professional work. I also curate events. I've been working at Spitterfields Music Festival in London as an associate artist. And there are times when I've been putting events on and I will invite a composer to work with me, and it will take them three months to respond. And then they're really inefficient in their ways of communicating. And you, know, you think about it in a very real way, and this may sound like a really mundane point, but I think it's absolutely invaluable, and it goes beyond the, the means of digital technologies we're using, but these technologies enable this process to happen so much faster. And it's invaluable that people actually communicate with each other and maintain that flow. So I make a living through multitasking, making lots of things happen at the same time, and being out there and doing things, you know. You go out and you meet people. You're socially engaged. Chances are you'll meet someone which will lead to something else, which will lead to something else. And sometimes it can take 10 years. But it generally happens. And I always stay in touch with people I've met. You know, I mean, a good example is a fellow here, Tom, a very nice man sitting at the front. We, we were complete strangers. He wrote to me some time ago, a few years ago, and said, would you like to come to Scotland to play this show, I did, then it followed up with a talk, then it followed up with something else. That's how life generally happens, that's how friends happen, you kind of like each other and you stay in contact with each other. And to me that's how work has always followed, you know, you stay in touch with interesting people. Yeah, and I like, I like meeting people who are building things, just come starting out building some bizarre little instrument. I think I'm going to support you and see this may lead to something for both of us, I get a new toy to play with. You get exposure as well. Let's see what we can both do with this. And, and so on. And, and again, there is no one answer, obviously, to this. Mm. You know, I don't have a regular wage. And some months it's amazing. And some days, it's, in some months, it's you know, totally dispiriting. But it all balances out in an overall picture. And it's about being happy as well and finding a place in yourself that you're content with. If you would allow me just to contextualize what, what you say, I think that uh, being open-minded, taking different projects, but also maybe not sticking to one way of expressing your music is, is key mm. to, to, uh, to adapting to the changes. I mean, you're doing this Bridge, uh, Bridge the World installation and you've, you've done records and cassettes and, uh, and you've done uh, music for advertisement. Mm. Uh, and I think that, uh, I mean, is, is a takeaway point from, from what you say that a composer to, to, to get work needs to have a portfolio of activities and, and try new things yeah. and, and and put oneself in outside of their comfort zone to keep to keep work coming. Comfort zone is really interesting, yeah, because I, I refuse to do things the same each time. So my audience 
I'd like to think, are very respectful for at least what do I do, because it always, it's always changing. You know, mm. My new record could sound completely different. I've, I mean, whether it's working with a string quartet, at the moment I work with London Sinfonietta on a piece that at the moment is, 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 is based on Nepalese singing and Frankie Vaughan. I mean, these are the two connection points, which sounds completely absurd, but it works, you know. I've, I've got a TV show coming on, a TV series, uh, and a six-week television series presented by uh, quite a significant figure in uh, pop music. That only came about because I fearlessly went out, actually, and I thought, I'm going to ask the BBC if they're interested. No response. I'm going to ask Channel 4. No response. I thought the digital networks are the place, so I asked Red Bull, and they immediately wrote back and mm -hmm. said, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So now I'm making a six-week series about how we listen to music. And even better, it won't be on normal TV, so everyone can see it. And it's not going to be like a product I can then sell on and sell on to another country. Everyone can have it at once, and it won't cost anything. And it's about sharing this thing, you know, this, mm. this kind of global... I don't, I'm not love, I don't want to sound like Bono, but it's a kind of a, a, a joyful uh, embrace of something that's really engaging. Mm. You know, music is a force that is so powerful... And you know, my argument is always that everybody listens to music in some way. It's one of the most powerful things. Maybe people don't read books so much anymore. But music is something that still has such meaning. It really does. It's something I'm still extremely passionate about. And I find it disheartening sometimes when I hear people complaining, saying, well, people don't buy records anymore. Or people don't make good music anymore. And we all hear these things. You think, <laughs> of course there's good stuff out there. You have to find it. You know? I, the one I heard was, there's too much music in the world. How can that be a problem? <laughs> too many people. Too, yeah, too, too much of everything. It's a problem if your model is based on scarcity. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. But I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I can come in on this, but I think there's, there's, a, there's a couple of things that I want to pick up on there. One is that um, I, I, I like the idea that you mentioned gambling because I, a friend of mine once said about working in the pop music industry prior to the internet, he said it was always a lottery and first prize was 10 years on a bus. And the, 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 like the, the ratio of people who make it to those who don't is, is astronomical. Like it, it was, you, you were either a lottery winner or nobody, and there was nothing in between those two things. And I think that now there is this amazing grayscale that all, goes all the way. I mean, people talk about the long tail as, as sort of super successful musicians, and then all these unsuccessful ones who collectively cr create all this kind of uh, economic well uh, well being. But what they don't see is there are people having sustainable careers, people that you haven't heard of who can make a good living being a musician, being a composer, being an artist, and they have their audience, they communicate with them, and it is that kind of communicative context that, that really, really works. The other thing I wanted to say off the back of yours was that while multitasking is a, is a really good thing to do, from the point of view of marketing and promotion, being the guy who dot, 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 is really, really useful. Um, I, there's an example, a friend of mine is a solo bass player, that's his thing, um, and he uses looping and he does um, kind of uh, it's sort of uh, an ambient middle ground between jazz and contemporary music, I guess, and, uh, and that's what he does. But it's not all that he does, and he does lots of things around that, but that's the central story. Is like He's the guy whose job sounds more like a dare than a vocation. It's like he's a solo bass player. Um, and, and I think that, that being able to tell that story, if you're talking about you know, how do I monetize, how do I make a living, how do I do actually having... Uh, a story that is central because all of these things, and we, we throw the word social media around a lot without actually thinking what it means. And these things that we make, these kind of um, musical texts or, um, or, or occasions or those sorts of things, those are um, what I call social objects. They're, they're occasions for conversation. And you don't get to have the uh, to sort of the, you don't get to say what that conversation is about. You are just the thing that is being discussed. But what you do is you make things and you put them into this context where people can make meaning from that and talk to each other about it. And it's the thing about which the conversation is taking place. And what the what the manner of that conversation is. I mean, the example is if you put a photo of a dog on Flickr and there follows a conversation, it might be about dog breeding, it might be about some political slogan on the wall behind the dog, it might be about any sorts of thing, but if you're making things and putting them out into the world, you are being a kind of a focal point for sociality, which I think is a really interesting place to be. And so thinking about seeding conversations and, and thereby kind of how do I be interesting, I guess is kind of like the, 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 the better question than how can I make money for the things that I just happen to do anyway. Um, you, you'll get kind of more fruitful results from that. Thank it's you. not just... I mean, did, did, if I, sorry. So, so I'm sorry, Michaela. No worries. We have only 10 minutes left, and I would really like uh, to hear what your questions are and how can we best answer 
um, the topic at hand from your perspective. Yes. Published um, musician, if you like, um, selling their own music. I, I, I put my stuff on Reverb Nation, but I don't know if it's the best site. I haven't got time to go through it every isn't. single site. Bandcamp's probably the best Bandcamp. one. Bandcamp. Which one? Bandcamp. 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 Okay, all right. Yeah. I will migrate. It, sounded, it started like it was going to be one of those questions that don't have a simple answer to it. But I know. One, it was like, oh, no, 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 we're yeah. agree. <laughs> I just guess <laughs> the word publishing, I'm leaving. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's a, it's right. probably the best one. It's the easiest to use. Yeah. Okay, any more and it works very efficiently, yeah. I have to say. Yeah. Mm. And they're really nice people. And they allow you to <laughs> price it at any, any price you wish. Actually, that's a really interesting point. Because you, can say, you, can, you can set your own price, but you can also allow people to pay more if they wish. And in those instances where do. they do, 50% of people always pay really? above the asking yeah. price. 50%. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So if you s let people... Not, not just pay whatever you want, but if you say it's five pounds or more, half of the people will pay the or more. Bandcamp will take only 10% to, to begin uh, with. Or 10% if you're making over 5,000 yeah. a year. And the rest is yours. So basically whatever your fans um, think you're worth, they're going to, and most yeah. of us do. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, That's just why you want to Reverb go Nation is a really good way of hiding your music. <laughs> yeah. okay, let's, let's, choose the next, uh, let's choose the next question. Here's a representative from Reverb Nation. So, yeah. <laughs> I've had this conversation with Reverb Nation. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so I, I think it was, it's, um, I want to ask, is similar to the, the, what I was saying earlier about there'd be, um, the music makers using new technology um, and making music in a different way, it being more about sort of creative collaboration and working mm -hmm. with people and not that being the sort of most important thing and then not thinking about sort of how do we sort of monetize it and make money out of it. So there's, there's loads of people doing it, but we, we don't read about them. We don't sort of, you know, no one's kind of writing about them. No one's really talking about them. The popular bands. I, okay, I don't know any popular band who's actually doing anything really, truly interactive and really collaborative with people. Um, I, certainly there are, um, it's a well-known kind of, uh, artists uh, like yourself and um, uh, popular um, music makers, but on a much more kind of, on a much more smaller scale. I'm just wondering if you think at any point soon or no, no, are, are there right. any popular bands out there who are really doing the, the things in The tip of us is you, you say bands, uh, which is a very kind of rock centric way of, the, and it is natural for us to do that, but, but actually the, the fact that they're bands makes it unlikely that they're going to do that. There are lots of musicians and artists doing it, but, but possibly I mean, I guess it depends them. on what you mean by, by that kind of interaction. Like, you could okay. consider, like, Beyonce putting her stems up on SoundCloud as for a remix well, that, competition. Well, actually, that's, that's a perfect example. As that, okay. that so is stems. something. Yeah. Stems is, for me, probably the easiest and most sort of... It's um, definitely the laziest way for, the, way for an artist to, for, to get art. something through. Well, I think it would be an amazing thing if more artists shared okay. their stems so. with people. Yeah, stems, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> stems are the component parts, the like tracks and music. Here are the drums, here is the bass part, here the are the individual guitars. channels. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's easy. Sorry. Continue. So, last year, Music Tech Fest 2013, so all the majors said we want to be part of it now because they see that, you know, Warp and um, Ninja are already, you know, part of the community and then the stuff that's happening, it's really exciting. And of course, they want, they want, they, they, you know, it's an exciting field. They don't know what's going to come out of it, but they, they want to be part of it. So I had a meeting with five directors at Sony. And first thing I said was, I don't want to talk rights. If you want to be part of this space, I don't care what your guys upstairs have to say. So what I'm interested in is fantastic artists, which, which you do have and great recording studios, and this is what your brand was built on. Now let's talk that. By the end of that spiel, basically they um, uh, said, uh, is it okay if we give you the stems on the hard drive? 330 gig of everything, everything, Laura and Vula and uh, Lulu James. All in bits, do whatever you want. And um, we uh, got, uh, basically people just kind of were able to be creative with those. We had one remix, which was which one. Um, 
um, which actually happened to be Andrew's son. I had, which we didn't have a clue. That, uh, didn't have a clue at the time that, that was uh, who it was. Proud parenting moment. Um, uh, but yeah, obviously a very good parent. But in any case, uh, that wasn't the point. The point was that the remix was then uh, put on their website, and it influenced them to release more stems to the public and say, "Has anybody else want to come up with more ideas?" Now. This is about sort of breaking silos and breaking uh, ways of doing things, breaking down ways of doing things. This year, uh, MTV have deliberately recorded um, a video uh, in, with you know all separate channels so that we could use. Um, who was it that we're, we're doing? We we're doing one of the up and coming artists who was doing really really well already. And but last year, what happened after this was that Mike Skinner just pinged us an email, said, "Hey guys, I've put my stems on the cloud. Do whatever you want." So I mean, you know, and he's more likely to be to do that kind of thing. But you know, so so there'll be there'll be people out there who'll be like, yeah, totally up for it. Um, but you know, once you start doing this, then of course uh, others want to participate, and and um, it starts at the ball rolling. How much do you think something like this can catch on? Because I I think it's a great idea. It'd be great to see it really explode and lo well, the, loads of The remix competition it. thing was like massive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the past like two years and a bit, I would say pretty much any kind of up-and-coming band ended up involved in a remix competition where either they were putting their stems out or they were actually getting exposure by by remixing what was coming through. And I think that's been happening. It just hasn't been happening on a major label level, really, until but, quite yeah, recently. Yeah, we're, 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 we're you're talking about the remix that's launched by... Um, uh, what we're talking about, including in the, in the fest this year, right? The remix competition. Oh, they, they did... Um uh, Samplephone. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah Samplephone yeah. was that's quite good. That that's who really sampled, um, which Sample is a pretty phone. cool company. Yeah. It lets you find all the samples in a song, <laughs> which is pretty awesome if you like nerdy samples. Yeah. Um, and they did a, a sample font where they just did like it was mental. Yeah. So they want to they want to do it. So they, they got the they got catalog yeah. from yeah. Uh, from uh, actually a production music library. Um, took some samples from it, provided it to some producers, and said you got 24 hours to make new tunes. Uh, that's kind of an interesting approach to, to, to doing this. But I, I, this is what I call the million dollar homepage problem. Um, I don't know if you, any of you remember the million dollar yes. homepage, right? So it was this this guy, a college student. Uh, this is sort of in the early days of the web. Said, right, I've got uh, a web page. There are a million pixels on it, and I'm going to make them all available for sale for one dollar to anyone who wants to use them to advertise. And so people were doing these kind of 10 by 20, uh, you know, pixel squares and, and, and rectangles and so on. And and one big company jumped on board. I can't remember what it was. It might have been Ford or I don't know, Coca-Cola or Nike or somebody. Um, took up a big space of it and paid a pile of money. So of course every other brand needed to be on it. Within three weeks, he had his million dollars. Um, and it was great. I've got a million dollars just for having a homepage available for sale. You know what didn't work was the second million dollar homepage. <laughs> somebody else said, well, I'm going to do that too. And of course nobody was interested. And I think that 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 kind of that flip side of innovation where it's only interesting because it's novel yeah. uh, is the problem. So like eight years ago, people were getting on the front page of The Guardian for releasing their album for free online. Imagine trying that now. It's like every man and his dog's got an album for free online. It, it's, it's not interesting anymore. So that idea of, of having to perpetually come up with something novel uh, is the problem that you're facing. And putting your stems online for a remix competition, it's like, yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah, so, unless, uh, hang on, unless... I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, we only have one minute left, and I think <laughs> that if we have an opportunity for one last question, yeah. and then we can uh, take it further. So, yeah, please. Yeah. Someone actually does it. Really yeah, thanks. Just, just it. a yeah, quick course. question. With all these tools and collaboration opportunities out there, what, what's your view uh, in terms of uh, intellectual property and uh, copyright and that sort of thing? <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a well, who It's question. broken, it's important, <laughs> and we need to fix it. Yep. Okay. One, one word, uh, one sentence about this very subject of copyright per person, if, 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 you, if you'd like, very quickly, about copyright. I'm open to all possibilities. Um, I think it, the copyright as a system was designed to kind of create a creative middle class in a way. Um, that, however, is a bit broken. And the, the way the system works now hasn't kind of kept up with the way people are creating and the way they're releasing and monetizing. So I think there's copyright reform needs to occur in order to, to continue helping people retain rights. And in order to do that, we need to start from first principles. What are we trying to achieve with copyright? To whose benefit? Is this something to make society better, to make culture better, to make more creative works? Or is it something to uh, essentially run a protection cartel for uh, major corporations? That, that's an interesting first question to start with. Michaela? You know where the word copyright comes from? 
it was the right to copy books back in the time of Charles II, and it was for publishers to make money out of copying artists' stuff. And this is the bit where you trip up, because your publisher is taking a massive chunk or whatever it is you do. You sign up to Bandcamp. Bandcamp is just a facilitator. It will take a small time. Okay, sorry. We, 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 sh we should. We should. We, they should be paying us for this. But yeah, sorry. Yeah. But but you know, it's just again. It's, but it's, it's a really good example at the moment where they are going to take a small cut just to be a facilitator and enabler. But the rest is yours. I mean, this is you're, you're the author. It's your right. So that someone shouldn't have shouldn't be dealing with your copyright if you have the right tools available. So well, thank you so much, everyone, for. Uh, Participating to this panel, I would like to invite you to, to stay a little bit longer and engage with uh, with the speakers individually or with Harry here. Um, well, let's uh, give a big round of applause to our speakers today. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Jamie.